All right, everybody. I'd like to thank all everyone who is joining us today. So welcome to today's CNC webinar, the Kubernetes native two-level resource management for AI ML workloads. My name is Daniel o. I'm working for Red Hat as a technical marketing major, as well as I'm responsible for CNCF ambassador as well. So luckily, I will be moderating today's great webinar. So we would like to welcome our presenter today, Diana Arroyo, a software engineer at IBM Research, and Aula Yushef, the manager container cloud platform at IBM Research as well. So there's a few couple of things about housekeeping today. So before we get started, uh, this webinar, so you are not able to talk as an attendee. So there is a Q&A box at, at the bottom of your screen. So please uh, feel free to drop your question in there and we will get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of CNCF. So this is, this is the subject to CNCF code we conduct. So please do not add anything to the chat or question uh, that will be a violation of the code we conduct. So please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note the recording and slides that will be posted later today at CNC webinar page, www.cncf.io slash webinars. You can find that later today. And I will hand it over to Diane and Ola to kick off today's presentation. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Daniel. And you, Daniel. Uh, let me share my screen. And I hope you can see it. Yes, we can right. see it. Okay, so uh, thank you all for joining today. Um, uh, I'm happy to take you through um, this presentation together with my colleague, Diana. Um, so a Kubernetes native uh, two level resource management for AI and machine learning workloads. And uh, our agenda today uh, basically, we want to start by saying why the Kubernetes scheduler is not enough for um, the scheduling and, and, and resource management related activities um, uh, for these AI and machine learning workloads. And um, then we will also talk about a few additional desired capabilities uh, on top of the shortcomings that um, we will discuss in the first point. Then after that, we will uh, show you our proposal to address these uh, um, shortcomings and desired capabilities, which is the multi-cluster app dispatcher, which is an open source project that we want to share with you and tell you a little bit about it and about how it works, show you a, a short, cool demo, and then a call to action, which you can guess. So why the Kubernetes scheduler is not enough? Actually, we had a recent CNCF blog post with the same title, um, about a couple of months ago. And uh, basically in, in that blog post, we try to motivate for, for the need of this second level resource manager that we are going to talk about today. So some of the characteristics of these AI workloads that we are targeting here. Um, so uh, basically you all know that, you know, it's uh, the use of uh, Kubernetes platform for running these AI and machine learning workloads is, is, is on the rise. And, and uh, these workloads have typically multiple concurrent learners or executors, right? For example, if you have, if you're using Spark, you have Spark executors. If you're using some, you know, doing some deep learning, you have deep learning uh, learners, right? And uh, typically they need to run concurrently in, in a distributed learning uh, fashion. They have some uh, co-location or affin affinity constraints. Um, uh, they may have some you know, specific hardware requirements such as using GPUs, for example, uh, and a specific number of GPUs per learner. Uh, also we're seeing um, nowadays an increase in the massively uh, parallel jobs where there is a big number of short running uh, tasks um, that need to be executed, like array jobs, for example. And, and, and these jobs are resource hungry, meaning if, if, uh, if you give the job all the resources to run the, 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 thousand, the thousand tasks that it's composed of, uh, it's willing to take all those resources and run the thousand tasks in parallel. If you give it less resources, um, it has nice 
you know, many of them have nice elastic features where um, if you give it resources enough, for example, to run a, a only 100 tasks at a time, then it will do 100 tasks at a time until it completes. It will take longer time to complete, but the total amount of consumed resources is going to be uh, the same. And why would you want to do that? Well, I mean, there are two reasons. First, I mean, the resources are not infinite, but second, you may want to um, regulate the flow so you allow for parallel jobs to proceed, especially with the increase in the use of um, uh, interactive mode, uh, like for example, data scientists sitting in front of a Jupyter notebook and running some of those uh, machine learning jobs and want to see results uh, interactively. So uh, they are not all batch jobs that, that you know, can be run later and, and, and when, the, when done, um, somebody's waiting for the result. So in this kind of, of, of uh, environment, right? So you have jobs and tasks, right? And, and then there is the, the, the advantages and disadvantages of managing at the job level versus at the task level. So typically a task maps to a Kubernetes pod and the job is composed of multiple of those pods or tasks. And now the question becomes, at which level should you be specifying things like priorities or classes of service, like you know, gold, silver, bronze, for example, or quotas, right? This is the maximum uh, quota on the memory resource or GPU resource for a particular uh, task, job, user, uh, organization. I mean, at which level should you set these things? Um, and also at which level do you do queuing of, uh, of these jobs or tasks, right? And then and allocate resources and do preemption, right? Uh, so these are all the questions, right? That, that don't have, um, you know, one answer, but, but um, you know, we are trying to argue here that really the, the, the right level of, of management that you need to have is at the job level. Um, and you need to do a lot of these functions at the job level, uh, not at the individual task level. Obviously the task will inherit from its, from its job. And think about what happens um, to your scheduler and the different controllers in your Kubernetes environment, right? And, and in your etcd, when you have, you know, thousands and thousands of, of, of pods belonging to, you know, thousands of, uh, of jobs that are pending and need to be scheduled. So if, as, as these jobs arrive, you create the pods and, and hand them over to the Kubernetes scheduler, it will be um, overwhelmed as well as the other controllers in the system. So briefly, uh, you may all know that, you know, the Kubernetes um, scheduler is a pod scheduler given a pod with particular dimensions like resource requests in the memory dimension, CPU dimension, GPU dimension, it basically filters out the nodes that, that don't fit that, uh, that pod or, or, or for any other constraints shouldn't be used for that pod. And, and then uh, for the remaining uh, nodes in the, in the cluster, it's going to prioritize them and, and rank them according to priority functions and um, get the, the, the top candidate to, to put the pod on, right? And then it binds the pod. So in this example here, you have a series of pods that are arriving and, and, and queued at the scheduler to schedule. They happen to belong to three jobs where each job um, has four executors or, or, or learners, right? Has four pods basically uh, in this simple example. And the job of the scheduler is to one by one schedule the pods. Um, and now imagine now that you have thousands of these jobs and all those pods are waiting for the scheduler to, to schedule them. And you obviously have limited capacity in your cluster and um, it will keep trying to schedule them and failing and schedule them and failing until, until once in a while it's able to uh, let in you know, one of the pods. So in this example, this is what happened, right? The pods got scheduled this way and you ended with two of the three jobs not being um, totally uh, placed uh, in the cluster. And, um, and now if, if, if these jobs require to be 
um, the whole job to be placed in order for the job to proceed to do the learning or uh, whatever it needs to do, then, then you have those two jobs, the, the purple and the red here in this example, some of their pods occupying space that is useless until the remaining pods can be um, scheduled. And um, you have partial deadlocks. So these partial deadlocks, obviously, if you have a gang scheduler, can help in solving them. But just remember that when you have thousands of pods, you could have avoided that altogether if you had a second level controller that is able to look at the cluster from a, a um, you know, high granularity level and let in to the scheduler only jobs that are um, likely to be placed. So, as I mentioned, the cluster resources are limited. Scaling up the cluster by adding nodes uh, takes time. is not something that you want to do instantaneously for every arriving job or, or leaving job. Uh, it's probably something you want to do at a, uh, um, a you know, little longer time scale. And as I said, these, some of these jobs are resource hungry. And no matter how much you scale the cluster, they're going to eat it up. So, Practically speaking, at every point in time, there is a limit on the available resources. And um, even if that limit is not permanent and is going to change, and you want to be efficiently using these available resources. So, you know, uh, the, 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 the common saying says the sky is the limit. But remember that <clears throat> it doesn't say that the cloud is the limit, right? So the cloud has limits. Um, in terms of available resources at every point in time. In addition to that, we are seeing the rise of um, you know, different patterns, uh, like multi-cluster uh, patterns, where organizations own you know, tens of clusters, tens of Kubernetes clusters. Um, and uh, these clusters are basically easier to manage than, than a huge, big, big cluster and, and that's contributing to the rise of this multi-cluster uh, pattern, pattern that we are seeing. And um, in, 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 in the hybrid cloud world where by default you have you know, some on-prem resources or on-prem clusters and then some public cloud and multiple public cloud clusters, uh, by definition you have um, a big number of clusters that you need to choose from um, where to place this next job that I need to run. Um, static assignment of users or certain uh, apps to a particular cluster uh, is feasible, but is not the efficient way uh, to use all your available clusters. Um, so you may have, uh, in addition to on-prem and public clusters, you may have uh, edge clusters as well, which increases the, the number of clusters um, uh, you know, tremendously. And, and, and in that case, right, um, the static allocation of a particular job or user to part so a certain cluster is not the best way to go. Bursting scenarios, people have, you know, seen them and talked about them for a while. Um, but you want to be able to do that in a more um, automatic way, right, where job is submitted, and then if there is no resources available in my on-prem cluster, then it's automatically routed to a public uh, cluster that I have a subscription in. Um, so finally, I mentioned about the, the rise of edge computing paradigm and, and what it means in terms of the, the number of, of clusters that an organization owns and, and, and is managing and the options to place a job. So in addition to what I mentioned, there are some desired capabilities that we're looking for. So I alluded to the need of having a, some form of queuing at the job level before admitting the pods to the scheduler to, to do the binding to specific nodes. And um, if you are able to do that, um, that queuing and dispatching to a specific cluster, before it reaches a, a scheduler in that cluster to do the fine-grained placement of the pods and binding them to specific nodes, um, then you have you know, achieved a lot. But in addition, also, this is a good point of control where you can specify priorities and classes of service 
and have multiple queues for different priorities or different classes of service where the jobs can wait to be dispatched to the appropriate cluster based on um, available capacity. Um, enforcement of, of quotas, like hierarchical quota management, for example, if you want to say, this is the quota in terms of resources that this particular organization or department or user is allowed to use in my system, then you can do, you can do that at this, at this control point in, in, in an easy uh, global way. Um, and you can think about all sorts of, you know, soft and hard quotas and, and of course, quotas that span multiple uh, resource dimensions. Also, you may be able to do things like, you know, preempting low priority jobs in order to admit higher priority jobs or um, jobs that borrowed, right, uh, from the soft quota of, of, of another organization, but now that organization has its, its jobs coming in and they have the right to go in and, and preempt um, those jobs that were borrowing uh, above their quota. So you can do these, all these controls at that um, second level uh, resource manager. Um, because it, it basically has a unified um, view of the jobs belonging to those different AI and, and, and machine learning frameworks. Um, so what is our solution to all the shortcomings that I mentioned and the desired capabilities that I also talked about is the um, uh, MCAT or multi-cluster app dispatcher, which is an open source project um, that um, we are going to tell you all about it and, and how it works. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Diana, and uh, she will take it from here, tell you a little bit about how it works and then show you a, a, a cool demo. So think, Diana, uh, do you want to share or do you want me to flip the, the charts? No, go, if you can uh, release the sharing. Okay. And I'll take over, if you don't mind. Okay, great. And I'll make this big. Okay, can you see my screen? I think I picked up on your last chart. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, thank you all. Um, <clears throat> so as, as Alan mentioned, we've developed a, a, a controller that tries to address some of these uh, capabilities. Uh, and we have an initial framework of one, and uh, I'll talk to you a bit about what it does now, and then some things we're looking at and adding, in, adding uh, in the roadmap. But essentially, um, as uh, Alan mentioned, we, we would like to have a way to dispatch to uh, either within one cluster or multiple clusters an ability for queuing. And this example, this high level picture here, we're just kind of showing how in a multi-cluster environment, you would submit a job in a what we call a dispatching cluster. And, and I'll give some more details about that, where you essentially submit all the components of a job. And there's a, uh, the MK controller, as you mentioned before, would do the initial evaluation whether that job is runnable and then determining whether it's runnable or not, dispatch it to um, other clusters to actually be realized and for the binding to happen within the cluster. Here's just a quick notification of how, you know, as Ala mentioned, we have an open source project for this. It's in GitHub and it's also in the uh, operator hub as well. So let me, uh, dig a little bit deeper on how this actually works. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, there's the MCAT controller, the multi-cluster app dispatcher. And with that, we operate on the uh, custom resource definition called an app wrapper. The app wrapper, what it does is, or what it is, is essentially any and all of your Kubernetes resources that you create, uh, the ones that are uh, compute consuming resources, for instance, deployments, pods, stateful sets, any of the resources that you uh, define as part of your complete job, uh, we wrap it in this app wrapper. And in, and in addition to that, we also uh, 
allow you to wrap of any non-compute consuming resources. For instance, many times you'll deploy as part of your job as a service, uh, maybe even name, uh, deploy them under different namespaces. So with all of those components that you have that represent your job or application, we have a CRD that you would submit it under and wrap it all so that it could be evaluated holistically. And then the MCAT controller, uh, what it does that operates on the app wrapper, it uh, takes the app wrapper, uh, actually uh, investigates it, inspects it, and determines whether that job, all the resources for that job can uh, be runnable. Uh, and it does it in a holistic manner, meaning it looks at all the items that you've listed in this wrapper and evaluates whether it can be runnable or not. If it does determine that it's runnable based on the policies, uh, then it unwraps all of the objects that you put in it, uh, all the Kubernetes objects, and uh, creates those objects in the cluster where they're dispatched to. Obviously, if they're not runnable, uh, we put it in the queue uh, to and reevaluate um, over time to make sure that we can dispatch it once resources become available. And then another thing is, as I mentioned earlier, was is that we support preemption and requeuing. And with that aspect, we actually allow um, app wrappers to have uh, dispatching priorities. You can define those, and I'll show how that actually works. Uh, in the YAML as well as a, a demo that, uh, that we have. Okay, so this is kind of pictorially what I've talked about in the first chart where we have the controller, the multi-cluster app dispatcher that's operating on the app wrapper. So you take whatever objects you were creating, the, any Kubernetes objects that you're creating, you put them inside of an app wrapper and then uh, submit that app wrapper to a Kubernetes uh, cluster and the app multi-cluster app dispatcher will operate on it. We have two configurations that we run actually. We started out with the standalone version, meaning you know this is just running within one Kubernetes cluster and we found uh, that worked really well and it was a nice extension to actually move it to multiple clusters. So, and this is the second bullet here where we have a dispatcher mode for uh, the Kubernetes cluster and an agent mode. And that last bullet really is the multi-cluster environment. Okay. So a little bit uh, more deeper into what's happening behind the scenes. So this big box right here is the, the MCAT controller. And uh, what it does is, is that it, uh, it, it runs with inside the cluster. Uh, it actually determines uh, the available capacity of the cluster. So it finds out what's actually running, what, how much resources are available uh, from, by using the normal Kubernetes uh, model. And uh, it, it tracks what's available um, over time. And in addition to that, as you bring in app wrappers into the system, uh, you submit them, the app wrappers will go into a queue. Again, it's all wrapped in, uh, the app wrapper wraps all the resources that you're trying to uh, realize into that cluster. Uh, and so we put them into a queue and this queue can be uh, FIFO. If you don't set priorities, that's how it behaves. If you do set uh, priorities on these app wrappers, then uh, the queue will be uh, the queue will uh, recognize that and recognize the, put the ones with the higher priorities at the beginning. And then the goal here for this MK controller is to uh, evaluate taking the available capacity, looking at what's in the queue, pulling uh, jobs off the queue, determining their runnability as I mentioned before, and if they're runnable, dispatch them and actually create the objects inside Kubernetes. So that's the standalone version. Here I'm showing just the modifications that we have made so that we can support multiple clusters. Um, in this picture here, you see these big blue boxes here and they're actually separate complete clusters. So this is a, a these two clusters on the right are what we call 
<clears throat> excuse me, agent clusters. And when you dispatch MCAD into that cluster, uh, you dispatch it in the uh, configuration of an agent. And then we have a, another cluster that acts as the dispatcher cluster. I mean, this is where jobs get submitted, right? And what happens is, is that the agent clusters, agent uh, controller uh, collects the available state or the available capacity for the individual cluster and makes it available to the dispatcher cluster. The dispatcher cluster or the uh, dispatcher uh, controller here keeps track of the available resources on the different cluster it's supporting. And then when you submit uh, app wrapper jobs into the dispatcher cluster, uh, they're put into the similar queue and then uh, they're evaluated on where they can run and uh, the dispatcher cluster will actually dispatch the job to the uh, cluster uh, where it chooses. Here's an example of, uh, I thought it would be useful to have like a use case so you can kind of see how this works. Let me see if I can minimize this, get this out of the way. So this is kind of covering it up, so I apologize, but this is an app wrapper here. But before we actually create the app wrapper, as I mentioned before, you bring these MCAD controllers up on the various system. This is the dispatcher cluster that I showed before and two agent clusters. Uh, and you have the MCAD controller running in different modes. Uh, so when that happens, the first thing that happens is the state is collected, meaning available resources and the local agents. And that state is made available to the uh, MCAD dispatcher uh, controller. And then uh, it's ready to receive app wrappers. So this is an example here. I have, uh, we, ha we worked with a team who had a, a bunch of resources that they were trying to create that represented one job. And this is actually really a subset of them that I put in here. But um, in their job that they submitted, they had multiple services. They had a namespace they were creating, a network policy, a PVC. They had uh, a couple of deployments that were creating. One of them just had one pod and another deployment had multiple pods. So what they did is they were creating those objects already and then they took our app wrapper and they just wrapped all of the objects in, that they were already creating inside the app wrapper. And I'll show how those are, how those actually look inside of our CRD. And they submitted into the dispatcher cluster, the dispatcher uh, cluster, MCAT, the MCAT controller on the dispatcher cluster picks it up, uh, inspects all the objects inside of it, determines if it's runnable and where it's runnable, and then dispatches them to the appropriate cluster. In this example here, I show that it's dispatched to agent one, where it's created, and then the local MK controller will actually take that object and uh, unwrap all of the objects. Uh, here, they're like uh, objects A through G, unwrap them and create it inside of this cluster here. And then let's see here. My screen is not working. There you go. <clears throat> so that's what we have as of today. And I wanted to give you guys some insight into kind of the things we're working on now as part of our roadmap. Uh, so this is the current work that's happening now. This is here, the box that you just saw in the previous where we had the MK controller, the queue and the available capacity where ob object gets submitted. But as, as we mentioned, we, just, we wanna add more policies to support the capabilities that I'll have described. And one of them is not only evaluating jobs where they're runnable based on available resources, but now we wanna extend that to uh, additional capabilities. And one of the first ones we're looking at is extending this to quota management. Uh, and so um, what, we want, what we have here, and this is just an example here is that uh, you may want to define quota, uh, not just like at an NCSIS level, which is already available in Kubernetes now, but maybe some abstract uh, administrative definition. Uh, so an example with that, of that would be possibly you may want to set quotas on organizations, uh, departments within those organizations. You also may want to set quotas on projects. So you could have multiple projects that you would set quotas on those. 
uh, and we also want to support soft and hard constraints on these quotas. Uh, so various aspects in enhancing the whole quota management uh, capability, not just like at a names namespace uh, level, but even more abstract. So um, this is the work we're doing now. We just wanted to give you some insight about how we would um, be able to take advantage of some quota management evaluation where, uh, yes, we would pull it into the controller to determine available resources, but we would also evaluate whether that job is runnable based on quota management uh, in the sense that, you know, we may have enough resources, but there may be hard limits that you want to restrict on some of these jobs. So we would queue it up and then uh, dispatch it once there's enough quota that's available. So that's some, some, yeah, some insight on what we have and how, how we're moving forward with enabling more and more capabilities. Um, at the evaluation of these, these jobs at a higher level. Uh, one more chart here, just to show you, as I mentioned before, um, the, the actual CRD that we have is the app wrapper. So this first arrow right here shows you would uh, express your, your job that you're gonna submit as an app wrapper. I'm gonna skip, skip these two guys just for a moment and go to the last one, which is uh, I mentioned that you would put all your objects inside of your app wrapper, so you would wrap them and you would just do it under the item stanza where you list, if you had, if you saw in the other chart, there was like seven or eight uh, different objects that we created, Kubernetes objects, they are listed under the item. So you just have a full list of things that you add here. And then as I mentioned before, you can set priorities um, on these, uh, uh, jobs as well, right? And we will, uh, this is a dispatching priority. So they're determining whether this job can dispatch and giving prior, higher priorities over other jobs. And then finally, uh, just some insight of where we might be able to express a quota information, right? So this job is assigned a specific quota uh, name that we would evaluate it based on the quota tree that gets built. And this is, again, as I mentioned, part of the roadmap that we're working on now. Okay, so I thought it would be also helpful to just get some insight on how this works with showing a demo. So let me jump over to the demo I have here. And I recorded this. So I'll talk through this demo. It's a very simple demo, but uh, I wanted to kind of show you guys um, how this works initially. And I'll show you examples of queuing and then this, uh, preemption with priority. Uh, so let me get started. Let me start this up. So on the left here is the black window and it's the dispatcher. Uh, uh, it's the dispatcher uh, controller and it's on a separate cluster. The green and the blue box are also separate clusters as well. I've made them very, very tiny because uh, I wanted to be able to fill up the cluster and show you the queuing. So each one of these clusters only has one node in there. And every node I think has about eight CPUs and available uh, right off the top is really just five CPUs. So um, down here on the bottom, I'm just gonna show you the app, as I submit the app wrappers, they're gonna show you the state and also show you that pods actually don't get created on the dispatcher cluster. Um, they only get to play, uh, created on the um, uh, agent clusters. So uh, the first job I'm gonna submit is job one. I'll show you the contents here. I kind of showed you some, some of that in the charts that I'm submitting an app wrapper. Uh, and then I list the items here. I'm only, I only have one item in here, it's a stateful set. And uh, but again, you would put as many items as you need to represent your job. And then of course, uh, since we're evaluating whether it's runnable or not, uh, here's the, the CPU that we're actually allocating. And in this example, we're having three replicas. So it's uh, uh, three replicas with that CPU and memory limit. So the first thing to do is really, is I'm gonna show is filling up both clusters. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, they right now they have about five CPUs available that are free before submitting any jobs. Uh, 
so uh, if you create one of those jobs, it's going to fill up about a, more, a little bit more than half. Uh, so we submitted it and it's actually dispatched to the blue cluster and it's actually running. Um, and then the next job that we'll submit here is job number two. Uh, and it's going to, uh, uh, we're going to submit this one. And, and what happens here also is that uh, when we uh, submit, and the policy that we have running here is just a random policy. Uh, we select, we just randomly pick a, a cluster. And uh, if it fails that cluster, uh, it will take, it'll go into back off mode and try again in about 20 seconds. And so this is what you're seeing here uh, is that it tried the first cluster was full. So it actually backed off for about 20 seconds and seconds and then retried it on a different cluster. And so um, the second job got submitted and it got dispatched on the second cluster. And next what I'm going to show is so now essentially these two clusters can't fit a third job of the same size. And so this is really to show you the, the first uh, ability, which is to be able to uh, queue the job um, and wait for resources to become available. Uh, again, I'm just showing here that it's the same, same size job. Uh, and since the cluster is full, it's not gonna be able to uh, create the jobs at all. And because it's not, it'll queue it up and there won't be any pending pods, which you would normally see if you just submit these uh, stateful sets without the app wrapper. Uh, there won't be any pending pods on any of these clusters. It'll just be the app wrapper that's pending. And so what that means is that the scheduler's not trying to do any work where it can't fit all of the pods. Um, and you'll see here that it's pending um, on the bottom left hand uh, window. Uh, the third job is pending. So now I'm going to show how when a job gets freed up uh, and the resources get freed, uh, the pending job automatically gets dispatched into a, 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 one of the clusters that become available. So job one uh, gets completed and job three will start to dispatch here shortly. There it goes. So I get dispatched. You know, uh, we, the MCAT controller detected that it was enough resources, so it dispatched the job to an available cluster. And then uh, finally, I wanted to show another simple demo here where we use priority to preempt for preemption. So here I'm setting the priority number of this job to 10. Um, all the other jobs, they didn't have a priority number defined. So by default, they have a priority of zero. So we're going to create that. Uh, again, it's the same size, but since this has a higher priority, uh, we evaluate what's actually already running and determine that everything else is lower priority. So we will preempt a lower priority job and actually uh, uh, put it back in the queue and allow the higher priority job to uh, be able to get dispatched. And this is, you want to use this kind of environment when you have uh, jobs that, uh, you know, takes uh, uh, um, timestamps and take, takes, uh, tracks the, the movement of the job and where you can restart it very easily. So that job got preempted. I think it was job number two got preempted. And then of course, uh, when uh, resources become free, uh, available again, uh, which I'll show here next, we'll free up uh, job number three. Uh, and then job number two will get redispatched. And again, I believe in this um, recording when I did it, uh, originally the job two was running on the green cluster, and now we're redispatching it to an available cluster, which is in the blue cluster. And I think I'm going to stop that now because 
We're running close to being done here. I want to give time for questions. As you can see there, that it's we got redispatched. So I'll stop this recording and uh, I think that's it. Um, the last chart I think I had was really just a call to action where, you know, feel free to give this a try out. That'd be great. Again, here's the links and the name on the operator hub. Give your feedback. We'd love it. Um, and even be even great if you can contribute as well. And that's it. I think we can uh, take questions now. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Diana and Allah. It's a really great presentation and awesome demo. So we now have some time for question. If you have any question and you would like to ask, please uh, drop it in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and we will get to as many as we can time go. It's your time. Must have been very clear. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, it's a very positive thing. So it's a pretty awesome and a really understandable demo. So, oh, we got a one question actually. So how can I configure the priority of jobs? Who wanna take this question? Yeah, so um, the priority of the job is set at the, um, as part of the app wrapper spec. So all you need to do is essentially just add that stanza, the priority stanza inside the app wrapper. Uh, let me see here. If I can show you again the, the example YAML. So when you submit your app wrapper, if you want to take advantage of the dispatching priorities, you would just add this stanza and set uh, the priority that you want that job to uh, get assigned to. So this is all configurable at the submission level, right? So whenever you submit a job, you set the priority uh, that you would like to have for the job to have. Cool. It's all configurable Thanks at the, the app wrapper. Thanks for the answer. And a following question from Chen. Can the priority be, can your priority be changed the later when it is in the queue? Uh, we, so right now we don't support that, but uh, we definitely have plans in our roadmaps to address that. Um, we also, uh, I showed you a highlight of, of the major things we're doing. One of the things we're also doing to address all kinds of complexities is which is, uh, 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 starvation, right? So we initially start out with this user-defined dispatching priority that you may, as a cluster administrator, be able to handle starvation when there's uh, low priority jobs, but you still want to get a few of them in. So we're currently uh, developing a, a system priority that will consider the user-defined priority, but over time, those priorities will change. Uh, and so we have we have that part of our roadmap as well. Cool. And another question just came up uh, from our Q&A box. You know, what is the role of the AI ML in a resource management? I can take that one. So uh, in terms of what we've uh, shown today, we are doing resource management for AI and ML uh, workloads. So it, it's the, the, the opposite. Of, of what um, the question is about. But uh, of course, um, the use of, of AI and machine learning um, in resource management, right, to in the resource management function, um, and its benefit there is obvious. And, uh, and we have uh, other orthogonal work, uh, for example, focusing on using uh, uh, AI in, in, in um, deciding on the scaling of uh, elastic applications. Uh, vertical or, or horizontal scaling, um, the use of uh, reinforcement learning to um, uh, work around failures and avoid failures. So, but, but different orthogonal uh, uh, pieces of work, um, the, uh, the MCAD uh, 
uh, controller is is not really using AI to um, to control resource management for uh, for the jobs. Great at the moment. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so I think uh, all question uh, we are addressed today. So, okay, uh, any other question? All right, uh, thanks Diana and Aura for the great presentation and the Korean and fresh invitation once again. And all right, uh, so, so, and everybody, thanks for joining us today again. And uh, the webinar recording and slides that will be online later today. And uh, we are looking forward to seeing you at the future CNC webinar, as well as KubeCon and Cloud NaviCon the next month in November. Please register and uh, we will meet soon again. And have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.